All right. Um, hi, so yeah, I am Sarah Bailey. My pronouns are she, her, and tonight I'm gonna to talk to you about how um, you can save the birds and the bees with safe sex as sort of a Valentine's Day around the corner, uh, fun conservation action talk. Let's see. Um, so first I just wanna give you a little bit of background about the Center for Biological Diversity in case you haven't heard of us. Um, we are a national environmental nonprofit uh, that advocates for endangered species. Um, we've been around for over 30 years now. And in that time, we've helped protect over 700 endangered species um, and over 500 million acres of critical habitat. And we do this using science, law, and creative media. So the majority of the folks who work at the center are scientists and lawyers. So they're doing a lot of litigation to protect environmental legislation, um, like the Endangered Species Act, the Migratory Bird Treaty Act, um, protecting various public lands. Um, we have a lot, we have a few offices scattered around the country um, with the majority being out west where there are more public lands to protect. Um, I work in a one woman home office <laughs> in Buffalo, um, even pre-COVID. Um, and within that, I work within our population and sustainability program. Um, and we're sort of the oddball of not having any lawyers in the program. Um, we are more education and outreach focused, hence getting to give fun presentations like this. Um, and that little kind of infographic uh, image to the on the left side of the screen is a cool representation of all the different species we help. So we don't focus on any uh, one specific species or taxa. Um, it's really everything all the way from little mollusks and shellfish and plants uh, to the charismatic megafauna. Um, so you can see in the middle of the circle, the white image is reptiles. Um, going out from that is amphibians. The orange image is birds. Uh, the yellow is mammals, the blue is fish, uh, the purple is invertebrates, and then the green leaves around indicate plants. So each little image indicates uh, an individual species. So sort of a cool breakdown of all the species we get to help. So overall, like, what are we up against as an environmental organization? Um, we are facing habitat destruction, species loss, climate change, um, and that's causing extreme weather events and all kinds of other bad stuff. Um, but ultimately, what is driving all of these threats? Um, so very common responses are fossil fuels, agriculture, pollution. Um, these are all correct. These are all threats in their own right um, that need to be addressed. But ultimately, at the heart of it, people are the common denominator. So our human population, at the rate it's growing, um, puts a lot of pressure on the planet. Um, as there are more people, we need we consume more resources, we take up more space, um, and it sort of exacerbates all those previously mentioned issues. And just to give you a breakdown of the numbers uh, with human population growth, um, it's been a sharp uptick in numbers in the last 50 years. Um, and that rate we're getting added is over 200,000 people uh, to the planet per day, and that's um, net growth. So that also accounts for like deaths that happen every day. Um, right now, we're sitting at around 7.8 billion people, and we are projected to hit 11 billion by the end of this century. Sorry, having some slight screen issues. There we go. Um, so this graph shows human population growth in relation to wildlife extinctions. Um, so you'll see on the uh, x-axis is the last 200 or so years with the purple line indicating um, human population growth and you can see that sharp uptick and the green line is number of um, wildlife extinctions. So basic broad strokes of this is in the last 50 years the human population has doubled and wildlife populations have halved. And then on the right of this slide is several recent studies. These are all from 2020. Um, that specifically are looking at how human population growth is impacting wildlife. Um, so that first, the one at the top, um, intense human pressure is widespread across terrestrial vertebrate ranges. That study looked at 20,000 species and looked at our, the human impact um, cumulatively. So what that means is they looked at roads, infrastructure, buildings, all the sort of things that we build and create as humans and how much that impacts species range. And I believe it was like over 80% of species studied were like severely impacted. So I think then it was 80% of their range was impacted to some degree. 
So a lot of things we'll look at bits and pieces um, of human activity and this really kind of brought it all together and looked at it all um, cumulatively, which was pretty impactful. Um, then there's also uh, the World Wildlife Fund put out a study last year, a report, um, and basically kind of the common thread was global wildlife population is being decimated by human actions. Um, and then study at the bottom looked at past and future impact on mammalian diversity. And I think that study kind of looked um, back at human history and basically when humans kind of came into an area that could become a prediction factor of species lost. So this is not necessarily a new impact we're having, but it's definitely happening at a much more increased um, and more severe rate now. Um, so that's a lot of big numbers and graphs. Um, I always like to look at individual species and kind of put a face to the problem. Um, so this first one is the passenger pigeon, which is a pretty classic example um, in wildlife conservation. So these used to be super common. Um, I'm blanking on the specific numbers, but there are all these um, records um, back in the 1800s um, of how when flocks of them would um, fly across the uh, sky, it would look like night. They would just block out the sun, there were so many. Um, so these were seen as a good source of food for hunting. Um, and within a hundred years, they were entirely wiped out. Um, so even when a species is seemingly plentiful, if you're not keeping tabs on them, they can still be taken out. And part of that has to do with biology. So sort of the value of um, making sure you're incorporating science into your conservation is um, they require a certain number to kind of group up when they're breeding. Um, so even when you get down to a certain number, it just kind of doesn't work for them. Um, and that type of top, top right picture is Martha, which was the last um, known passenger pigeon who, I forget what year she died, but we went from hundreds of thousands of them to a couple within a hundred years. And then this is a species that still is currently around. This is the Bethany Beach Firefly. And as compared to the passenger pigeon that had a very wide range, they have a very small range in coastal Delaware. Um, and they are currently under threat from development because coastal habitat is really popular for land development for vacation houses and the like. Um, and they also um, are hurt with, when there's a lot of spraying for mosquitoes. So that top right picture is a mosquito. Um, also typically where you have lots of people, people don't like mosquitoes, spraying happens, and that can impact other species as well. So that's another species that the center works on working to protect like a, their very small bit of critical habitat they have. And this guy, this is the hellbender. Um, also, they have a really fun nickname of the snot otter. And these are uh, North America's largest uh, amphibian. So I always like to have the pictures of them in the hand so you can really get the scale of that. Um, and there's a few species of them. They also have um, some pretty small ranges. And like all amphibians, they're really sensitive to water pollution. Um, so whether it's pesticide runoff from agriculture, um, pollution from roads nearby, um, anytime a lot, there's a lot of human activity around them, um, their habitat is gonna be very quickly impacted. And then we've got mountain lions, which um, they used to have a really wide range across the US and are now dwindling in numbers. Um, their biggest threat is um, habitat fragmentation. So when highways get built through their, they need a, a lot of territory to roam around. When we build highways through it, even though it's not seemingly taking up like a chunk of land, it's cutting it, they have to cross it. Um, and that's what that picture in the bottom right is. Um, car collisions are a major, um, threat to them now. Um, and they've got these cute little baby cubs, so you don't want them orphaned. Some other examples, uh, we've got the California condor. Um, so they're, they're actually a success story. So I am trying to have some good news in here as well. <laughs> um, their numbers dwindled, I think, to like the single digits um, back in the 70s or 80s, I think. And um, they're actually a really successful example of a captive breeding program. So. Um, a bunch of zoos and various like government agencies and uh, the Southwest in California took the remaining ones into the remaining ones from the wild into captivity um, and were able to successfully captive breed them and uh, release them back onto the wild. So that picture in the uh, top left 
is actually a puppet they used to feed the little chicks so that they would not imprint on people. Uh, the picture below that, you can see uh, the tags on the wings, which is pretty cool. If you see them in the wild, um, there's a bridge in Arizona where they can hang out sometimes. You can see their numbers um, with the naked eye. So most of the ones, most if not all the ones in the wild now are um, descendants from this captive breeding program. Um, they actually celebrated the 1,000th chick hatching last summer. Um, but they do still face some threats today um, with lead ammunition in carcasses. Um, so there are areas of the habitat where they're working on a lead ammunition ban because when you shoot an animal with lead and the ammunition gets left in it, they scavenge and they can eat it and it poisons them. Um, and they are still, you know, kind of as everywhere as there's um, out in the Southwest sprawl is really common. There's still a lot of open space that's getting built out into. Um, so they're facing habitat destruction, which is sort of a key element I always like to point out in regards to captive breeding programs. Um, it's really great when they're successful, but if you're doing them, you need to make sure there is habitat to put them back out in. Um, so it can all be really great happening in the zoo and making more birds, but you need to make sure that the habitat is still preserved. Um, oh, and then the top right is uh, one of our, the California condor endangered species condom package, which we have, but I will touch on those later. Um, then we've also got the flat-tailed horned lizard. Um, so again, um, Southwest species, so they're facing a lot of development and sprawl. Um, they also face kind of the very specific threat of off-roading, so that's a popular thing to do in open spaces. And if you look at these guys, they blend in really well with the ground, um, and they're pretty tiny, so you're not going to see them when you're driving around in a big truck. Um, and then just a fun biology fact, one of their defense mechanisms is to squirt blood out of their eye, um, which is that bottom left picture. It's not like actually an injured lizard. Then we've got the monarch butterfly, probably the most familiar widespread species of the bunch that I'm going to talk about. So these are really cool. Um, I think it might be fairly well known with monarch butterflies that they have this um, really long migration from like the Midwest and the US down to Mexico. Um, something I didn't know when I first learned about this was that it's not the same butterfly. They, there's stops along the way. They have their babies kind of on the way down, on the way back. Um, and what they're facing, agriculture is a big threat to them um, because of the pesticides used on it is um, obviously not good for them as well. Um, also, as we replace um, the, the species they live on and feed on um, both as caterpillars and as adults, um, as we replace those with like monoculture crops, that's not good for them. Th those plants are important pit stops because again, it's they have a lot of stops to make on, uh, to make on the way down to Mexico. Um, and a lot of this land is also used for livestock as well. Um, or it's used for livestock and the crops being grown are often used, not even being used for feeding people, but used for feeding livestock. Um, <coughs> excuse me. So if you see this map, um, you can see where the corn belt goes in um, along their migration path. Um, and a lot of them are kind of like all getting funneled down into one spot. So the, um, their overwintering, overwintering place in Mexico is also really critical habitat. And then we've got the sea otter. So these are again where their species who has bounced back from really um, low numbers. They were almost hunted to extinction for fur hunting and they did make a comeback. Um, but they do continue to face threats due to offshore drilling and commercial fishing. Um, they can get caught as bycatch. And they're really, uh, they're a critical keystone species, meaning that they have a really important role within their ecosystem. Um, when sea otter numbers get really low, uh, they're not eating enough sea urchins, and then the sea urchins uh, will decimate the kelp forests. Um, so once you have otter, once you lose otters, there's then a trickle down effect on the whole um, ecosystem that everything gets out of whack. So besides being cute, they're very critical to keep around. And at the center, we also, we try to prevent um, further offshore drilling off the California coast. So another way we're trying to protect them. And then we've got the whooping crane. Um, so these are really cool birds. Another um, successful captive breeding program um, where they've also humans help them migrate, uh, which is that top center picture of the person Kind of flying that like one man plane um, that helps them with migration from the Midwest down to the South. Um, but they're also facing habitat loss um, and industrialization in the wetland areas uh, that they breed at and feed at. Um, and also is that bottom right picture power lines when they're 
they're big birds and when they're taking off those power lines can get in the way and be a problem. So just it's one of those things where our infrastructure impacts other species. So those are my species. So back to population growth. Um, so specifically at the center, we focus on US population growth. Um, and that's particularly to address our outsized consumption. Um, and that um, despite that there's other uh, organizations working in other countries, uh, there's still a lot of room for improvement um, for um, increasing reproductive equity and autonomy within the US. Um, I don't think I mentioned it later in this presentation, but um, nearly 50% of all pregnancies in the US are unplanned. So that's where we see a big room for improvement. Um, and to kind of give you an idea of what this outsized consumption looks like, um, Americans have one of the largest carbon footprints in the world per an individual. So while other countries may emit more than us overall, per the individual, we have one of the highest impacts. Um, and you may say, hey, like I recycle, I eat plant-based diets, I don't even have a car. Um, my emissions are really low, my impact's low. Um, just by nature of being in America, you're like the they call it the basement, the lowest level uh, that your footprint is likely to be is 8.5 tons. So there's a study done by MIT that looked at this. So you see the blue footprint is the estimated average for a US resident. It's 20 tons of carbon emissions per year. There's the green footprint that is the world average, which is four tons per year. And then the estimated average for a US homeless person. So you can view that as a very low impact lifestyle and it's still eight and a half tons. Um, so yeah, just, we consume a lot <laughs> and our, the, just the culture of living in the US is we tend to consume quite a bit more than other countries. And then uh, this graph is, uh, I think a really interesting graph that came from a study a few years ago. And this looks at different green actions. So we commonly hear the ways we can reduce our impact um, like by recycling and driving less and switching to renewable energy. Uh, but often we don't know how those uh, actions stack up against each other. So the X axis, just list all your common actions. And then the y-axis going up is the number of tons of emissions saved per year by doing that action. So you see upgrade your light bulbs, hang your laundry to dry, recycle, wash your clothes in cold water, switch to a hybrid car, a vegetarian diet, buying green energy, canceling a transatlantic flight, going carless, or having one less child. So that is an option people don't, don't usually know about as a way to reduce their impact of just, not to say that, that is a thing you'd casually do like you would recycling <laughs> or washing your clothes in cold water, but people don't often realize the impact having a child has. Um, again, and this is based on in the US, um, it's nearly 60 tons of carbon. So even if you were to do all these other actions listed before that, that would still sort of cancel it out. So overall, um, you know, what is the connection of family planning and how that can save wildlife? Just how do we connect those dots? Um, so as the world's population grows, so do its demands for water, land, trees, and fossil fuels. And voluntary family planning can help reduce pressure on the planet. So by understanding this relationship, um, access to contraception and sex education can be an integral part of the environmental movement. So the first step is reducing unplanned pregnancies. And this can be done um, by making all uh, types of contraception available. Um, so whether that is condoms, uh, pills, an IUD, um, using, increase, using contraceptives decreases unplanned pregnancies and often leads to lower fertility rates. And this by, thereby will empower, increases empowerment for women and girls. Um, so with improved access to contraception, reproductive health care, and education, women and girls can choose to, choose to delay having children or have smaller families. Um, so women's empowerment is super important, um, you know, allowing women to get the education. Um, lots of studies show that uh, women who um, have more education will tend to delay and spread out having kids, um, but giving them the tools to be able to make those choices um, is critical for that. Um, and this, by, this thereby will leave more room for wildlife. Um, so population pressure pushes wildlife out of their homes and closer to extinction. And by reducing unplanned pregnancies, um, it helps us leave more food, water, and shelter for wildlife to thrive. And overall, this helps us build resilience for wildlife and for us. Um, when people are able to make the right reproductive decisions for themselves, the benefits to their health, families, and the environment will help us build resilient communities. 
So I've shown you some of the condom art along the way, um, and I have more of that to share later because I want to kind of bring the presentation back up. <laughs> but here's some other ones we have about other forms of contraception. So we have IUDs put the power in you to save the mountain caribou. A pill a day gives the Northern Rockies fish or more room to play. And Plan B helps when there's been a mistake, saving you and the Eastern Diamondback rattlesnake. And these are some of our other condom artwork from, um, I think this is from the original set when this, this project started 11 years ago. So we've got cover your tweedle, save the burying beetle. Use a stopper, save the hopper. Wear a jimmy hat, save the big cat. Wrap with care, save the polar bear. Pump smarter, save the snail darter. Save the spotted owl, wear a condom now. And then we have don't go bear, panthers are rare. When you're feeling tender, think about the hellbender. Be a savvy lover, protect the snow, snowy plover. In the sack, save the leatherback. The wrap with care, save the polar bear. Safe intercourse, saves the dwarf seahorse. Um, so we've got all these, the information, we have the information, we have all the punny phrases. Um, so why do people not wanna talk about population? Um, so this comic is always very, I'd like to put this in, it's a very succinct way sometimes of how these conversations go. So top it says, we've got to deal with the root cause of global warming. Right, let's talk about sustainability. Let's talk clean energy, sustainable agriculture and carbon footprints. Actually, how about we talk about sustainable human population? Sorry, we don't talk about that. So why don't people wanna talk about that? So unfortunately there are a lot of negative things that are associated with um, conversations around population. So we always like to be very clear of what our philosophy is with this work. Um, and it is not population control, coercion, ecofascism, genocide, eugenics, or closing borders. What we do support is human rights, reproductive rights, quality of life, social justice, all so we can have a thriving um, people and planet. And to get into a little more of this, of like the misconceptions some people have around population, um, so often it's easy for people to think, you know, I should have, I started, I started the presentation with graphs. It's um, easy to think that this is just about the number of people. Um, so often maybe they want to talk about population, but not in the US and, you know, countries with higher fertility rates. Um, but like I said, the consumption patterns play a part as well. Um, and then sometimes people just want to dictate uh, the number of children people can have with policies. Um, China's one child policy comes up a lot in these conversations. Um, but there are a lot of human rights issues with that. So what really are the better solutions are comprehensive strategies that incorporate a rights-based approach um, from many angles and denounce any coercive policies. Um, we always come back to the family planning has to be voluntary. Um, and then there's people who wanna dismiss all these conversations altogether um, for a number of reasons, maybe like some of those um, negative connotations of other things. Um, that I mentioned earlier. But if we don't talk about population pressures at all, we miss a chance to promote the just and equitable solutions. And there's also a lot of perpetuating um, false dichotomies of either or thinking of it's just population or it's just consumption. Um, it's, high, it's countries that consume a lot versus high fertility countries. Um, but ultimately we need a combination of approaches and solutions to address, address the impacts of population pressure. Basically, there's a, there's a lot of ways to work on this and almost none of them are wrong. Let me keep using my cursor. There we go. And then often there can be a lack of gender inclusivity and equity in this. Um, and the key thing is equity is about everyone feeling empowered. Um, but we, there are barriers um, to a lot. There are barriers in people's way that are stopping them from accessing healthcare and having agency in those, we need to remove those. Um, and often there will be statements about how certain people shouldn't have children, but everyone should have the right to have or not have children. Um, and we need to have support systems in place. So what are we at the center doing about all this? <laughs> um, the species and people not wanting to talk about population when we see it's like a really critical issue in the extinction crisis. Um, so we aim to bring population back into the conversation. Um, and we wanna do that by focusing on the ethical non-coercive solutions. Um, and we do this through, the, through a number of ways, um, one of which is our endangered species condoms project. So all this, the fun art I've been showing you with cute illustrations, 
that project started 11 years ago. Um, and it's an out, it's a great outreach tool because you get to give people information and a literal way to prevent unplanned pregnancies. Um, we also have our pillow talk program where we do specifically do outreach with zoos, museums, and science centers to reach an audience, you know, through their adult focused events. <laughs> so reaching age appropriate audience um, and reaching the audience who's interested in conservation, likes wildlife, likes science. Um, and we do all kinds of other outreach programs um, with campuses, coalitions, conferences, environmental education centers, media, public events, and survey and focus groups. Um, so like I was saying, the condoms are a really unique icebreaker and tool. Um, it helps us pr um, promote the right space and effective solutions, and it uses humor. It's a lot easier to get people to talk about this when you're starting off with a goofy pun. And like I said, literally you're giving people a way um, to practice safe sex. So all the species on the condom packages are specifically North American species that are particularly impacted by human population growth. So you saw the polar bear, the monarch, we've got the horned lizard. Uh, the California condor was a fun contest we did last year for our 10th anniversary. We picked, um, I think we had a list of like 20 species that were like, um, fell within our, like our qualification of US or North American species that are impacted uh, by human population growth, but not a species we already have on the package. And we had a social media contest of submit your slogan ideas. And then we picked our top five and had people vote and um, the California condor was the winner. So before you're close at the floor, uh, think of the California condor. Um, and then I showed you earlier the caribou, the rattlesnake, um, the ones are about other forms of contraception. We have those on little uh, business cards and on the back is a QR code for a website that kind of gives a good overview of all the contraceptive options. Because um, we recognize condoms are, they're a good one. They're the only one that does disease prevention. They're easy to hand out, but they're not the best for everyone. Um, so we do want people to un better understand all of their options. And these are just some fun pictures of the condoms at events. So we've got, there was a, a vet tech program at Colorado Mountain College uh, that had their little bearded dragon pose with the horn-tailed lizard. <laughs> and then, um, we've got this hawk picking out its favorite condom at an event we did up here in Buffalo. And this is our current array of packages that we have available. So we've got for the sake of the horned lizard, slow down love wizard. When you're feeling tender, think about the hellbender. Fumbling in the dark, think of the monarch. Wrap with care, save the polar bear. Before it gets any hotter, remember the sea otter. And can't refrain, remember the whooping crane. And then I guess it was three or four years ago, we launched a Spanish language con, uh, condom packages just to be, you know, be more inclusive, be able to reach more people with this message. Um, so the monarch and the polar bear made it in there and then we added two more. So we have um, the Mexican wolf and the vaquita. So my Spanish is really bad, so I won't make you guys suffer through that. But the translations are <laughs> protect the wolf, covering it all. Save the vaquita, don't sow your seeds cover your thing, protect the butterfly, and save the bear, put on your hat. Um, and in case you don't know, the vaquita is a very tiny porpoise um, off, I think the Baja of California. Um, they have like less than 20 species left. They're impacted, um, they're often catch and bycatch um, in unsustainable shrimping operations, but they are very, very cute. And then some other, so I have the California condor package in there again. Um, and then another one we did, sometimes we co-brand with other organizations. Um, so this one with the feet before your seduction, think footprint reduction, um, is with a group called Global Footprint Network that calculates, um, they do Earth Overshoot Day every year, which is um, every year they will calculate the day that we use up all the Earth's resources, it often falls before the end of the year. So how we're overshooting our, like, what can be produced by the Earth every year. Um, so yeah, if you want to learn more about any of this, we have a lot of really good resources. Um, if you, if you really like the endangered species condoms and have a way you want to give them out, um, I didn't dive into our volunteer program, but we have people all over the country giving out the condoms. Um, <clears throat> like I said, whether it's your school, um, community center, youth group, where among your friends and family, we send the condoms out for free. So that is a thing that you're able to sign up for. So you can go to endangeredspeciescondoms.org and sign up and we will send you some. Um, it's getting a little close to Valentine's Day now, but um, call it Earth Day, that could be one. Um, 
holiday stocking stuffers. We give them out year round. Um, we've given away over a million um, since the project started. Um, if any of that research was really interesting to you, we have um, a whole database of the re co compiles the research um, done on how human population growth is impacting wildlife, and that is called crowdedplanet.org. Um, and there's nice little summaries I've written about all of them, so you don't have to dive into the whole paper if you don't want to. <laughs> but we have um, lots of studies reviewing the impacts, and then also a lot of really great studies reviewing the effective solutions um, around education and voluntary family planning. We also have on the consumption side of things, we have our wildlife friendly wedding guide. It's a guide to how to have a sustainable wedding. Um, and it kind of, it's a little more, it's less intense than a whole book on it, but more than a little listicle. And it actually breaks down some of the numbers about, you know, how much carbon emissions are saved when you have your reception and wedding in the same place, or if you opt for a plant-based menu. Um, so that lives free online. It's got a lot of nice pictures and quotes from real couples and talking about sustainable choices they made. We have our holiday guide called Simplify the Holidays. And that um, similar, uh, it's just encouraging alternative gift giving um, and just kind of more conscious consumption. Uh, and finally, we've got all of our social media handles. Um, so we are some variety of choose wild on all of them. Um, with the Instagram, there's just a little underscore in between uh, choose and wild. But YouTube's got a lot of cool animated videos. We have a new series called um, Contraception Conversations um, where we interview people talking about their various family planning decisions and what they did. Um, and all of those are good to keep up with events we're doing. We'll be having more virtual events throughout the year, um, including in three weeks, uh, we are doing a virtual screening and panel discussion for the movie To Kid or Not To Kid. So that will be Thursday, February 18th at 7 p.m. Um, the movie's about um, a woman's kind of process of choosing whether to have kids or not. Um, and she interviews lots of other people about their various family planning decisions. Um, kind of looks at cultural pressures and um, you know what barriers we face to certain types of contraception. So we'll be having a panel discussion that night with the director and a few other speakers. Um, and I'm sorry, I don't have more information. We don't have our, we don't have a link for signing up for that, but if you check out our social media channels, um, promotion and links will be there shortly. Um, and yeah, if you have any questions about any of this or interested in partnerships, um, I put my email there, sbailey at biologicaldiversity.org. Um, I see we have some questions in the Q and A, but if something pops up later or I don't get to it, um, feel free to shoot me an email there. And that is my presentation. All right, thank you, Sarah. Uh, and as you uh, astutely noted, we do have uh, several questions in the Q and A. Uh, so what we'll do is we'll give everyone a minute to start thinking about some other questions that you would like to put in there. Uh, Sarah and I are gonna take a quick look at them and uh, we'll get started. Uh, so we'll ask that anybody puts their uh, questions right there in the Q&A box. I see Mark uh, F. has raised a hand, uh, but we, we're not gonna be able to you know, put anyone else on screen or, or audio here with our webinar. So please uh, do go ahead and put all those questions in the Q&A box. All right, so uh, Sarah, like I said, the Q&A is always the, uh, the really interesting part of Cafe Sci. Uh, and uh, we, we're no doubt off to a great start here. Uh, let's start with, uh, with a really easy one here. And I think this is one that came in right at the beginning. Uh, Carol Hepner wants to know what all those ribbons are hanging on your wall. <laughs> oh man, usually I it's, I like to run races and it's my medals. And I usually mean to take it down because I'm like not trying to brag in the background. <laughs> 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 or I give myself a virtual background. I just did not have my act together tonight. <laughs> Excellent. Um, so uh, we have uh, a couple of uh, entries here from Ellen. Uh, Ellen saw the condom packs at the zoo's Valentine's dinner last year. Fun way to get the message out and follows yeah. up a question. Has 
uh, have U.S. pregnancies decreased at all yet? Uh, you know, many women are marrying later and having babies later, which may lead to uh, less babies. And I do know that there are some countries out there that do have a negative population uh, growth rate uh, right now. Do you have any data on uh, that trend in the U.S.? Yeah. So um, pregnancies, so like right there can be demographically, there's a lot of, you can break down of that, this of like um, pregnancies or and various outcomes, but the birth rate in the U.S. is, is dropping. Um, and like Ellen said, um, yeah, people, women are delaying marriage, um, which usually results in delaying kids. So yeah, the birth rate is dropping. As far as unplanned pregnancy rate, I'm not as sure about that. I think that kind of there's more of a delay on getting that data. Hopefully it will be, um, but that's sort of a factor of a lot of other like programs and availability of healthcare that impact that. So birth rate, yes, dropping. Okay. Uh, we have uh, a couple more questions here already. Uh, the next one on the list is from an anonymous attendee. Uh, and the question is, the most virulent opponents of contraception, abortion, and women's empowerment are patriarchal religions. Uh, the Catholic Church, evangelicals, and others deny and restrict reproductive health care. How can we oppose these huge misogynist organizations? And I'm guessing that's a question you've uh, received similar variants to, uh, you know, over your course of uh, working in this position. So uh, how do you respond to that one? Yeah, um, so for sure, there are definitely um, forces at play limiting access to healthcare, whether that be contraception, abortion, um, and ultimately removing women's right to choose. Um, so we definitely support like policy um, to make those more accessible. Um, we don't necessarily like work against religious groups. And something I learned once I started doing this work is there sort of are, there's groups kind of within all religions that are that do advocate for choice and access. Um, there's actually a group called Catholics for Choice. Um, so while these may not be like the largest representation of the groups, um, there are groups, you, there are like faith-based organizations you can find common ground with and there can be beneficial work to be done working with them. Um, but ultimately like we kind of see more of our work being on the policy level. Hopefully that answers that. Okay. Uh, we have one from Virginia. Uh, the, the, the person, not the state, although we can't rule that out, uh, Cafe Sci <laughs> online, you can be tuning in from anywhere, uh, regarding recycling to reduce the carbon footprint, I have read that companies where recyclable materials are sent do not find the process profitable, and China no longer wants these materials, what's the solution? Yeah, that's definitely like one of the biggest problems, because I feel like that that's a whole that could be its own presentation about <laughs> recycling how it's kind of a broken system now. Uh, my colleague actually is a former like recycling coordinator who became disenfranchised with it and like got out of it. Um, ultimately just kind of consuming, like consuming less, it might be like an oversimplification, but um, I don't like, like, I'll use my family as an example. My parents buy plastic water bottles, but they, they're like, it's fine, we recycle them. And I try to explain that still requires an ener like energy use to process and recycle. And there's a whole plastic can only be recycled a few times versus like glass and aluminum that can be recycled many times. Um, so just trying to like opt for reusables whenever possible. Um, so that that's like the personal thing, but then also um, we need more thing we need more broader systems um, to make it easier for us to use reusables, um, like the bulk bins at the grocery store, which unfortunately with COVID kind of took a hit. I know the ones at my local grocery store kind of got shut down for a while. Um, but yeah, by, there's like the individual choices, um, but then there are like broader things like uh, plastic bag bans are a great way to like enforce policy um, so we have less disposable plastics out there. Um, and there's things like at the center, we are working to shut down and prevent um, new, like, I think they're called not fracking, um, plastic cracker plants, where they like make more of the plastic that go to these like cheap plastic things. So sort of like one side, like what you're purchasing, you can kind of be more careful about buying things with a lot of plastic. Um, and then finding there's the Break Free, Break Free from Plastic Act that's being introduced, 
I'm not as well versed in the policy, but that's a good policy to look into. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of different angles to a lot of environmental issues, and yeah, we would we always try to balance the end of like there's it's nice when you can feel empowered by your individual choices, but like we also need the broader systems to make it easier and more accessible for everyone to make those choices, and that's we try to always balance that at the center. Sure, uh, and you know, in addition to those, you know personal choices and political movements and choices being made, there's also the economic impacts of it. I mean, right now we're at a point where making plastic, uh, virgin plastic is cheaper than recycling it. Um, so there's there's very little economic incentive. So yeah, it, it's a very, very tough time. Um, I can say that, you know, at the Science Center before, we uh, unfortunately had to you know, close our on-site cafe uh, during the COVID pandemic. Uh, we had been shifting to uh, selling waters in aluminum cans uh, over plastic bottles. Uh, and I've seen a lot of places that have water in recyclable paper cartons, uh, sort of like a juice carton, but it's a, it's a water carton. So uh, there are alternatives out there for a lot of things. Uh, it's not always easy to find them, unfortunately. Uh, so here's another one from an anonymous attendee. Uh, here's a rule you can add to your population control methods list. Stay single, don't date, and don't mate. So that is... Uh, uh, that, is that is a strategy that probably works great for some people. But yeah. we, want option, we want options for people who do want to, well, maybe not like mate to procreate, but <laughs> if they do choose, we want it to be safe. Yeah. And, you know, more power to you if that is your choice. Uh, I, I don't think the Center for Biological Diversity will come down on you for that. Uh, we have one from Kelly. Uh, Kelly wants, uh, Kelly's question reads, why do conservation efforts focus so much on individual choices when regulating industry would have a more dramatic impact? Yeah, uh, I, I scrolled down and saw that right after I was kind of mentioning that balance of individual and systems actions. Um, yeah, no, I think that's definitely a critique. And this sort of kind of starts to get at that either or thinking of individual versus system action. So for sure, like it's always easy to tell people to like change their behavior on the individual level. Um, and people do like it. I mean, it is empowering to be able to change things um, in your day to day life that make an impact. But yeah, we definitely, you know, we need both for sure. Um, so I think, I don't know, I can't speak for the entire conservation movement. I imagine it's easy <laughs> to tell people the individual change. Um, but we, I, I agree that we absolutely need both and regulating the industry is one of those things that would help um, in improving various things in our culture and society to make conservation easier for everyone. Uh, let's see, we've got uh, two more anonymous ones coming up, uh, but that means there is plenty of time for you to submit your questions anonymously or not. Uh, that is totally your choice. Uh, we'll go through these ones, and I also have a couple questions myself that I wrote down here or a couple of uh, things to note, and uh, I've got my cat complaining over here that her question hasn't been asked yet, but we're going to go with the human questions here. Uh, let's see, this one is, uh, it's from Anonymous and maybe less of a question, but more of a, a comment. Uh, we need to turn the tables on society's promotion of childbearing instead of asking single people, especially women, when they, when are they having children? We need to ask everybody why they are having children. So why are you making that choice? Uh, people having large families should have to justify their irresponsible actions. So that is uh, a comment there, and thank you for your comment. Sarah, is there anything you would like to uh, respond to with that one? Sure. Um, yeah, no, I agree. There's sort of like societal and cultural pressure that's real and like needs to also be addressed. It's sort of like also a factor of um, doing this work internationally, being culturally sensitive um, to that discussion. Um, and I think there is kind of like a disproportionate um, pressure on maybe maybe not just always single women, but women in general to like handle, like bear the burden of any family planning. Um, so actually those contraception conversations we have on YouTube, the first series we did was all about vasectomies. Um, so about the, the male taking the lead on that, which um, I thought was an interesting thing to share because so often it's just, you know, it's all on women. 
Um, so knowing that men also, you know, it takes two to tango, men play a part in that as well. Um, and just to note that the larger families, um, I don't necessarily think they have to justify having larger families. It's not inherently irresponsible. Um, our whole um, perspective on this is um, giving everyone the education and resources that they need to have the family size they want. Um, so, as, you know, if they want a large family, that should be okay. Um, Cause we just want everyone to be able to make the choices um, which is big tenant of reproductive justice. Okay, thank you. And another question, would it be more beneficial to return bottles and wash slash disinfect them like they did many years ago and reuse them? Uh, and hmm. uh, so that, that's, a good, that's a good question. Uh, I, I, if you don't mind, Sarah, I would like to just throw in an anecdote of my own here. Uh, right Go before the pandemic hit, I was able to uh, had the opportunity to visit uh, Germany last February and was just really impressed uh, with their system of handling bottles. So basically every plastic bottle you bought, whether that was from a vending machine or in the grocery stores, had uh, a deposit that you paid on it. And so every grocery store that I went to you could take all of your plastic bottles and feed them into this machine and it would uh, suck the bottle in, rotate it around, scan the code on the label, and then it would spit back out your, um, your deposit that you paid on it. Uh, and I think in the time that we were there, it was the equivalent of $10 that we got back uh, just from you know re returning those deposits on the bottles. They called it the, the FOND system. Uh, so I, I, I personally think that was a really, really neat system that, you know, has worked in a lot of other places. Uh, but as far as the, the reusable bottles there, um, anything from your point of view, Sarah? Um, I'm just, I'm sure it would be, but we don't have the systems in place. <laughs> yeah, um, it's pretty common. I mean, yeah, is, I mean, I feel like reuse is always better. <laughs> Yeah, it's one of those things. It used to be commonplace, but then when we started getting really, really cheap plastic, uh, you know, products in the market, uh, economic forces sort of tipped the needle the other way on on those uh, deposits and uh, you know local bottling, uh, you know, reuse programs. But yeah, it's it's something that is being done in in some countries at least. There's always the small options. My, uh, I always like to bring my growler to the brewery instead of yeah. needing more cans and bottles. I can just refill that. <laughs> so there's like little ways we can do that. Mm -hmm. All right. There's a couple more good questions coming in here. Uh, John asks, when Sarah said an additional child will contribute 58.6 tons uh, of carbon, is that including the pregnancy uh, plus the birth, uh, the first year... Uh, a childhood contribution, like up until 18, a lifetime contribution. Give us some more context for that uh, 58.6 yeah. number. No, that, that's a great clarifying question. Um, that is lifetime. So I believe the study, it kind of took, um, it was based off another study that did uh, calculated lifetime emissions for different countries. So like the average lifetime emissions for US and then divided by average life expectancy, which I think is around 80. Um, so yeah, that is, lifetime um but yeah the per year savings then is the 58 tons good question all right excellent question uh we have one here from kelly uh what kinds of things can i do uh to advocate for wildlife in my community i see a lot of butterfly or wildlife habitat being lost to suburban sprawl yeah um Making your habitat, if you have any kind of yard space to create more habitat, um, planting native plants is huge. Um, and assuming you're in the Pittsburgh area, um, I'm sure there's uh, specific, I'm, I'm not super great with plants, but I know uh, like cone flowers are a really good one. So uh, milkweed is like a good one. If we're gonna like look at monarchs as an example, milkweed's really critical for the caterpillars. Um, but then also sometimes what gets forgotten is that you need flowers for the adults to feed on, you know, as they make that trip back down south. Um, so cone flowers are really good for that. Um, but yeah, anytime you're planting native uh, species, it's, you know, good for your local birds. 
um, mammals, insects, and then it's also kind of, um, you know, native plants are adapted to the amount of water your area gets. So you don't, you're not gonna be wasting additional water um, feeding something and they're gonna be adapted for your climate. So it should hopefully be a lower maintenance plant to have in general. So that's sort of the easy one. And then, you know, broader on your community level, um, you know, if there's development, if there's critical habitat, looking under construction, you can go just kind of get involved with your local conservation groups, um, see what they're working on um, at the center. Um, so our website is biologicaldiversity.org. Um, we have all kinds of action alerts and petitions you can sign and get active and get in touch with your representatives about issues that help wildlife. Yeah, and I, I'll add to that, um, that Kelly, if indeed you are in Pennsylvania, uh, you can also uh, get in touch with the Penn State uh, Extension Office. They have a lot of really great information about native plants that you can use uh, if you have property of your own uh, that you can plant uh, to make a grain garden uh, and, and other, you know, home habitat improvements like that. Uh, so the Penn State Extension and also several, several municipalities uh, around Pittsburgh already have pre-approved uh, pre plans for um, environmental improvements that you can do around your home. So if you're looking for something that's easy to implement, uh, you might want to check out your township or your borough or your city's uh, planning department. They may have plans available uh, all ready to go. All right, we'll give another moment here. Uh, that takes us through all the questions that have been submitted so far. Uh, we'll give another moment for any last minute questions, but while we wait for any more to filter through, um, I would be remiss if I didn't remind everybody that uh, Cafe Sci, while we love seeing you here live, we know not everybody can make it uh, on that Monday evening, so we will be uploading this talk to YouTube, uh, the Carnegie Science Center's YouTube channel. Uh, you can find that later this week. And if you're enjoying Cafe Sci and you'd like to support us, um, obviously monetary donations are great, but maybe one of the better things that you can even do is invite a friend to join you for Cafe Sci. So uh, share that link and help us uh, grow our audience and just get uh, more science in the hands of the people. All right, one more question came in here from Mark. Uh, so how would the 58.6 tons estimate and the other carbon source estimates in the graph uh, determined as far as baseline year versus various scenarios to reduce greenhouse gas uh, in the decades ahead? Um, and I don't know if you think it might be helpful to even bring those graphs back up in the presentation. Sarah. Sure. And... Yeah, There we go. So I think inherently that sort of is a question mark. Um, I've read a few of the studies that kind of look at various um, emissions reduction actions and how they'll kind of impact like on a larger time scale. And I think this might be an oversimplification, but in the interest of time, <laughs> um, I think kind of the technology aspect is a question mark and kind of what policies will come into play. Um, that will maybe like force our hand on some of these. Like um, there's gonna, um, I know California is working on some legislation about emissions with cars. I'm failing to remember the uh, details. Um, but I, I think that is inherently a question mark, um, whether broadly or maybe just for myself. <laughs> but that is, that's off like any kind of, uh, most of the papers I've read about this kind of, that's always the caveat is like, we don't really know what's gonna happen down the line. like we know we just know, like we just know it's dire enough we need to be doing much much better than we are now yeah that's one of the challenges of working on things on human time scales is you know it's a big ship to steer and you, you don't see everything happening in real time and getting data to try to make better decisions you know sometimes means that those decisions are already outdated so it's tough uh, yeah I, I saw this person's name in the list, and uh, I'm Sanford. It's good to, uh, to you know see you, as it were, and hear from you here. Sanford is uh, one of our veterans of the Science Center, uh, and Sanford wants to wish everyone a happy Groundhog Day. 
And uh, remember, Phil's shadow can prevent global warming. So if we get enough groundhogs, I'm this isn't Sanford's commentary here now. I'm going to add my own comment. Uh, so if we get enough groundhogs in orbit, uh, we can uh, you know reflect some of that heat back out into space. Maybe that's not the best uh, for for the groundhogs, but it might be good for us. Sanford, it's good to hear from you. Thank you, sir. And Mark, uh, because to stabilize CO2 concentration in the atmosphere, doesn't this require something like an 80% reduction in uh, global greenhouse gas emissions from uh, human sources? I don't know those exact numbers, but that sounds like a dramatic and potentially accurate amount. I would suggest you can check out the Crowded Planet database. <laughs> I've taken notes on a bunch of studies that I can't automatically remember right now. But yeah, I mean, it, we do need a dramatic reduction. Whether it's 80%, I'm not entirely sure, but that doesn't sound out of the realm of possibility. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I, I appreciate all the uh, great, you know, questions about CO2 and, and emissions and climate change. Um, but you know it's it's a it's a huge issue with so many moving parts, um, and I appreciate you being here, Sarah. Uh, but you're focusing on some different parts necessarily than all of you know the uh, emissions, and you know that's one of the challenges too we see in scientific endeavors is that we've got so many people working on these problems in so many places uh, that it's it's hard to. For any one person to keep track of it all so um, yeah definitely uh, there there is a lot of uh, a lot of reduction that is you know projected to to be needed to stabilize uh, you know uh, the situation but you know we're already over the 400 uh, mark for co2 400 parts uh, per million in the atmosphere and it keeps going up, so you know it's it's a problem that is is evergreen, I think, uh, for right now. Sadly, uh, we'll give it one more moment here. If we get any more questions to pop up, uh, I will also say that I I checked for the passenger pigeon uh, for you. It was 1914. Uh, in Cincinnati okay. was uh, when the last passenger pigeon uh, died. And you know, I don't know what the numbers were for the population, but I do know that there were single flocks that would be uh, comprised of over a billion individual birds. And they would stretch oh, wow. for miles across the sky. So, uh, yeah, they had a lot of a lot of pressures on them. They had, you know, over harvesting. They also had a lot of habitat loss involved. Um, and, and those multiple pressures, uh, you know, like you said, they took a species that seemed to be, you know, a permanent fixture on the landscape and within a century uh, wiped it, you know, from existence. So that's something that we see a lot in, in a lot of those species is, you know, those, those multiple threats. And it's not just one thing. Yeah. But God, and the other don't have as generous numbers to work with. <laughs> right. You start a lot lower with most things. All right. Well, it looks like we are uh, have exhausted our supply of questions for the evening. If you have any closing remarks you'd like to give us, Sarah, uh, the floor is yours. Um, thanks again for tuning in, everyone. Um, I appreciate y'all coming to listen to talk about this. Um, and, and yeah, just um, biologicaldiversity.org if you want to learn more about the center, um, endangered species, condoms.org uh, if you're interested in volunteering with our condoms project. Um, and yeah, I hope I was able to answer everyone's questions. And if not, I'm happy to continue this discussion over email. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, for joining us tonight, Sarah, and thanks to the Center for Biological Diversity for uh, sharing you with us this evening. And I would also like to take an opportunity to welcome you all back in a month's time on March 1st for our next uh, Cafe Sci presentation, which we will feature Dr. Tulia Bruno from uh, the University of Pittsburgh's Hillman Cancer Institute. She is an uh, immunologist working 
uh, on human cancer growth. So uh, definitely come back for that one and share with your friends. Again, Sarah, thank you so much. And we'll see you all in a month's time. Thanks for tuning in tonight, everybody. Bye. Night, everyone.